and then say shells, they have terrible minimum sentences. And then for some of some of the minor stuff you you have a minimum sentence of five to twenty years or something. You start at five years or you start at ten years. One of the important things in criminal justice reform would be to abolish minimum sentences. You can have maximum sentences the way you like, but what is relevant really for prison incarceration rates are the minimum sentences. So there are countries where the minimum prison sentence for all crimes is one day in prison. That should be how it should be. And then when you are a multiple murderer, then you get maybe 500 years in prison. But the minimum sentence is always one day in prison. So the judge can judge according to the circumstances of the case what he thinks is good. They took the power of the judge away for a number of good reasons and especially for a number of bad reasons in the 1970s with their neoclassical school, with their sentencing guidelines, with minimum sentences sort of things. That's a whole topic in itself. And that should never have been done. That should be abolished. The moment we abolish minimum sentences or we make it a general minimum sentence for all crimes of one day in prison and leave the determination of the sentence to the judges, that moment overcrowding in prison will end. Another thing we might consider abolishing is truth in sentencing uh, to forbid early release of parole, etc. The third thing, and then I want to close for today, um, the third thing we should do, uh, and it's very easy to do, is to not put people in prison for nonviolent crime. I mean, today people are put in prison for marijuana, and if you're a marijuana trader, in Saudi Arabia, they will decapitate you. They have done that over the last years. There have been brothers who had imported marijuana to Saudi Arabia, and they were publicly decapitated in Rio. <coughs> now, in California, you can grow marijuana, you can sell it, and you can buy it, and you can make a lot of money with it. So this is absurd. It's like homosexuality. In, in some countries, it's a lifestyle, and you're the mayor of Paris, or you're the mayor of Berlin, and you're a homosexual, everything is okay. In Uganda, they want to apply the death penalty for, for homosexuals. There are so many countries <coughs> still in the world that have criminal penalties for homosexuals. And, as I said, in some countries, they even kill them. Iran, they have been doing that, and in a number of countries. And this is, marijuana is no different from being a homosexual. It's a lifestyle question. And you can be for marijuana or against being gay, but this is a question of lifestyle. I personally am against marijuana. I don't want to have to be gay either. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but, but why should I kill people who smoke marijuana or sell marijuana or who are gay? It, it's, I mean, in what kind of world are we living? And people are having such a hard time with criminal justice reform. But when you look at what so-called criminal justice is all about in most parts of the world, it's so absurd to have this. And in this country, like in my country, in my country also, when, when you have too much marijuana, you're, you're pretty likely to wander into a prison. And, and uh, if you belong to some sort of unwanted minority, you're even more likely. I mean, what kind of... And then they say, oh, how can we empty the prison? That's so difficult. <laughs> yeah, it's very difficult when you have minimum sentences, when you put people in prison for completely nonviolent, consensual behaviors. And then it is very, very difficult. But also when you 
when you believe in witches, it's very, very difficult to get rid of witches. You know? it's, it, when you're crazy, everything is very difficult. And in our criminal justice legislation, we are still crazy. Why? Not even, not even a bag of cocaine kills anybody necessarily. Like, like, like a whole loja de cachaça doesn't necessarily kill anybody, but you can kill yourself with cachaça. You can kill somebody else when you take a bottle of sequenta <laughs> and break it on somebody's head. Of course, you can you can take a bottle of sequenta and you can take your <coughs> SUV and kill a lot of people. But this is being taken care of much more reasonably with alcohol laws. Alcohol is not prohibited, but when you when when you drink and kill somebody, then you get in trouble, justly so. So that should be applied to, to the, but for just selling and buying, if, if we put everybody who sells and buys Cinquenta U in prison, we would, we would even have a few more people. And then we would say, oh, how, how can we get in the prison? That's so difficult, we have 35 million Brazilians in prison because of selling and buying cinquenta you And then, how do we get them out of prison? Yeah, maybe not put them in prison. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the sense of this headline. That is really the deeper sense of this very, very well made headline. Now basta construir presidios, é preciso prender com critério. <laughs> é preciso prender com critério, gente. De deixa o pessoal da maconha, deixa o pessoal das drogas fora da prisão. E você não vai ter que pensar como vamos esvaziar as prisões. Isso, isso é <laughs> Ok, thank you for your patience. Pennsylvania model and so on, it anguishes me a little because 
when we look at the Brazilian prison system, I see a, a deeper relationship with slavery than I see with the Pennsylvania model. And if we think about um, a viable confinement model, it, coming from the history that we come from, how could that be? Yeah. Um, I, I think you, um, you hit the nail on the head. The, the dangerousness question and its political malleability is when we think of the post-prison situation, that will be the central question. And you hit the nail on the head in a second sense also when you said that the, the histor historical review centering on the Pennsylvania system anguished you a little bit because there was also the slavery route, and you're completely right. Um, it's a distortion. It's, I, I will start with the last point. It's a distortion in the historiography of the prison that you find everywhere that people say, like Foucault said, you know, it all started with the Pennsylvania thing. You find it in the whole penological literature, it's just hegemonic, and it's wrong. And unfortunately, you find it in my little thing, too. and it's wrong, and I will correct it. And there is a literature uh, that corrects, tries to correct this historiography, and it says, at least for the United States, even for the United States, the real history of the prison system is not Philadelphia, it is Philadelphia and plantation and slavery. It is these two things together that can only explain the whole development until today. And what you see today is much more the plantation slavery uh, thing than the Philadelphia thing. The Philadelphia thing has become mythologized, and I'm very sorry that I reproduced that, but it takes me a time to to digest the, uh, the true information. But it will certainly be corrected also in my little work. Can I just add one little thing for you to put into your analysis? So Angela Davis and also uh, Akin Bambi from Senegal, they both um, argue that um, the type of violence that we see in, our, uh, in racialized societies nowadays is like extending um, the racialized violence that would be targeted to um, black people, indigenous people, to white people, and that would be um, like mass incarceration hitting white people also. Yeah. So she, so Angela Davis talks about how the the prison industrial complex is a type of racialized violence that, as a collateral effect, affects people that are not people of color. Yes. yes. Yes, and she is completely right. She is completely right. Um, and that is, uh, yeah, that has to be corrected urgently. I don't know why I didn't incorporate that earlier. I've, I've been so accustomed to the ritual uh, way of writing history, and I have done some research in Germany on uh, solitary confinement in Germany, especially for political prisoners. So for me, solitary confinement was very prominent because of my own prison research history. And I, so I've done a lot of stuff on these Puritans and Quakers and, and things. So I was a little confined in, uh, in my little limited uh, stuff that I was doing. But you're completely right, it has to be corrected. And I have been reading good, very good literature on the, and of course I know Angela Davis, um, but also, um, well, Loïc Vacan, of course, also uh, of this thing. Uh, I, uh, yes, what I wanted to say was one big eye opener that I don't know why that is not more well known 
in criminological circles, even though it was written by one of the most famous criminologists, uh, John Braithwaite. Um, and he has written um, Crime in a Convict Republic. And that is quite some time ago. I think it, I, now don't, don't cite me. Maybe that was 2002 or something. Um, Crime in a Convict Republic. That is such a great article. And it opposes countries with a slavery tradition. And he takes the United States. And countries with a non-slavery tradition, like Australia. They were all convicts who were sent to Australia. They were all criminals, but they did not have slavery. And then he compares how the situation in Australia evolved, and they have no mass incarceration because they did not have slavery, and they did not have the whole pathology of ex-slaveholder societies. They did not have the high incarceration rate, even though they were all criminals. Because they didn't have the high incarceration rates, they didn't have high recidivism rates, and they didn't produce a criminal class like the United States. They are producing it. It's one of the big products of the United States society. And he, he does it so plausibly and beautifully and well researched and, and balanced in a good way that I don't know why this has not entered standard textbooks. But that would also go into your direction that you have to make a distinction between ex-slaveholder societies and other societies. And if you, or if we, go through the list of incarceration rates, the Wikipedia list, and if we add a, a variable that says, which one is an ex-slaveholder society, we will probably find that all the countries with, with, with the absurd high incarceration rate are ex-slaveholder societies. That is a variable that Wikipedia doesn't use, criminology doesn't use, but Braithwaite has used it, has introduced it, but nobody has taken it up. And that would be a very, very good thing to do. Even Seychelles, <laughs> ex-slaveholder society. I mean, with their few people, but one thing they certainly had was slaves. And that's so, that these points were very good and they correct a lot of stuff that I have uh, erroneously or biasedly said. My point in the beginning was, how can we talk about a viable, just, humane way of confining those who it would be necessary to confine when we're coming from these starting points of a former slaveholding country? Yeah, yeah. There's. Um, Unless we burn all the judges and then start <laughs> <laughs> Well, well one, one good way would be to put all the judges in prison <laughs> for one day and one night. They would then start writing books how urgent it is to reform the criminal <laughs> There's so much more. Uh, there, there is one page, a page within my little article, The Voices of Abolition, and then it opens uh, a catalog of quotes by people who are saying that prisons have to be abolished, branch and root. And that's an impressive list. Also, some judges uh, say that. And there was also an experiment in one city in the United States where actually judges went to prison, spent a night in prison, and then it is being reported what they were saying the, the day after. And they, what, they, basically they were saying, let's get some bulldozers and get some, let's get rid of this <laughs> <laughs> So that would be one important step. Put all judges and all prosecutors <laughs> in prison for one day and one night. A week. A week. <laughs> 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 Nine and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> Twelve years. <laughs> <laughs>
Is det er fjol? Det er vel noget, det er fjol. Det er noget, det er kort. Ja. Well, there's so much more to, to, to be said. You're, you're very, you're, you're completely straight to the heart of the matter with the um, question of the politically charged definition of dangerousness. Uh, of course, in the, in the law and order, order society and, and in this political climate, you're completely right. Um, somebody who, who has stolen a beer in Jela will be considered dangerous by the shop owner and by a few people in the neighborhood, especially if the neighborhood is of the punitive kind, like the many. Will it be like a new culpability theory or something? Yeah. Uh, in parallel with the notion of culpability, maybe? The dangerousness. Mean, yeah. And then the whole theory yeah, we'll, around we'll the dangerousness. Yes, and we will have a faculty for dangerousness. <laughs> Faculdade de perigosidade. Can be a good person to their peers. The, the point is, who's, who is this person dangerous to? And yeah. Like, dangerous in yeah. itself, it means nothing. Yeah, right. You are completely right. Yeah. Now, what? Yeah, maybe you have a solution. No, the, at least, absolutely. I would not presume to have a solution, but uh, in a sense, yeah. And I completely agree with the idea that uh, the concept of danger might be politically maneuvered. But also, in a sense, it has at least some, um, and uh, th 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 it has something to do, right? Uh, if you go through the, the I want to say an ontological nature, but I would not go that far. Maybe, but but the, the, this is but the, in a sense, in a sense. At the same time, while we are discussing, what we may be discussing, okay. But uh, is that dangerous to whom? For specific actions, you can quite agree with me that there are actions that are undoubtedly dangerous, right? I mean, if if we look if we look through a notion of. Uh, Let's see through a notion of, of working class criminology. So not a not a criminology that's only focused on why working class people are uh, actors uh, in a sense that are criminals. We might say that, but also as victims. Then that the whole idea of danger suddenly becomes really important because you have to have something in order to pinpoint. Okay, so there are people who are bad. There are bad people in the world. I mean, yes, there are. I mean, if, 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 if you don't, uh, I'm so maybe the Monsanto CEO, That's he, where can, you lost he can be dangerous. No, but, yeah. but, 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 but here's, the, here's the point. How can you not say that a person who uh, rapes another person is not bad? That's a bad person. But then there's the question. Person. No, that's a misogynistic bad. person. Yes. That's patriarchy. That's because not that a bad person. A that's person. a Christian way of okay, seeing okay, society. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, then let me reenact. That maybe not a bad person, but maybe a person who commits uh, willful bad actions. And you have to do something about that. But then there's the question about how long does the person stays there? How long does she no, stay there? No, absolutely. Who will decide Absolutely. That? But no, no, I quite agree with you. But the point is, there is an and an dangers and an and danger to that person in a possibility that she might commit another act like that. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not being I'm not being uh, I'm not condoning prisons, please. But also in another sense, I I think that is something that we have to take into account. Is you it think not? It's very arbitrary. What kind of dangerous? is unacceptable in the eyes of the criminal justice system and what is not because if you look at a police officer that kills people at random because he snorted too much coke before work that person is way more dangerous than someone who steals a car every now and then sure. with a toy gun sure. okay. well, but, and nothing is going to happen to him because he is perceived by the law enforcement people by the criminal judge who is going to judge him as an important asset to our society through a discourse 
of law and order that is going to keep the person who steals the car with the toy gun in jail for years because that person is dangerous under the, the eyes of the same law. And also about rape. Rape is something really difficult to work with if you're working with a victim mm -hmm. because the the defense that the defense you have to do you got to prove that the victim is not lying in a way that is way more that expects way more evidence than the day by day theft accusation so yeah, yeah, but, but there are different but types of bad <laughs> and dangerous. Yeah, for sure, but you want to get on girls. And a Porque o debate me interessa, mas ele não pode se formular assim. Não, não pode. Não, não, não é possível. Você sabe isso. É, porque <risos> se vocês não conseguem formular objetivamente. It's ok. É verdade. Porque se vocês não conseguem formular objetivamente, significa que vocês ainda precisam passar pela formulação disso. Sim. Numa síntese, nós estamos mais ou menos discutindo isso. Proposta do professor, que eu endosso, e que ela tem que se apresentar em termos mais ou menos superficiais, porque não tem tempo para a gente poder enfrentar a realidade do sistema prisional brasileiro com o diagnóstico completo, é de que é contra a prisão, mas que existe ou remanesce a possibilidade de confinamento. Da mesma forma que existe intervenção terapêutica, da mesma forma que se vocês tiverem um parente, espero que nunca tenha que use de maneira problemática drogas e seja uma pessoa que você ame muito ou que entre num estado de esquizofrenia e você vai ter que colocar ele numa instituição e vai ser um ato de amor e carinho porque senão ele pode se matar ou matar outras pessoas ou produzir dano ou sair pelado pela rua e ser atropelado e destruir a vida de alguém não então, a possibilidade de confinamento existe e existem pessoas cujos comportamentos objetivamente demandam certo tipo de restrição como diz o presidente do estudo de psiquiatria da USP você as detém para que elas voltem a ser livres, porque elas não podem tomar, como o sujeito que ejaculou no ônibus, certo? Esse sujeito tinha feito isso 18 vezes antes. Se é, se é perigoso, com certeza é um ato de indignidade absoluta. Né? Dizer que é perigoso ejacular em alguém, é difícil dizer perigoso, mesmo o critério de violência. Mas, com certeza esse sujeito não pode usar o transporte público, estão de acordo? E com certeza ele não pode fazer tratamentos públicos porque ele se masturba compulsivamente. Ele não é livre para fazer isso, certo? Então, ele, objetivamente, recairia num tipo de descrição que a gente diria, olha, talvez ele tenha que estar, por algum tempo, se possível, confinado, para que possa restituir os seus atos de liberdade. O que a gente não ganha é jogando um 213 nele, dizendo que ele é um estuprador, condenando ele para ficar no seguro do estupro para poder cumprir pena. Lógico, a lógica de acabar com a prisão é como a advertência do Kuzma. Você tem que acabar com o criminal justice system. E acabando com o Criminal Justice System, você não tem mais o debate de culpabilidade versus perigosidade, medida de segurança versus pena. Você está trabalhando em medidas protetivas para o sujeito e para os outros. E aí você tira da escala do criminal, certo? E aí a gente vai dizer, claro, parece absolutamente idealista no Brasil, e aí o problema nosso é não confiar nos nossos juízes, e a gente tem boas razões para isso, porque os juízes brasileiros não assimilaram a experiência democrática, e é claro que eles têm preconceitos raciais, de classe, que vão se expressar. E nós descobrimos com a lei de drogas, por exemplo, que aumentar a discricionariedade deles foi ruim, que eles prenderam mais quando a gente deu mais yeah. discricionariedade. Na Folha de São Paulo, eles estão citando um opinião pública entre os juízes brasileiros, e algo como 70% são para higher penalties para as drogas ofensas. E, eu quero dizer, nesse ponto de tempo, To say we need even higher penalties for drug offenses, this is uh, how far away from reality, reality can you get? Crazy. Então, não, não, mas eu acho que o desafio de vocês, como estudantes, como profissionais, é a, abandonar o abolicionismo utópico, que tem sido um pouco a, a, digamos, a resenha do abolicionismo no Brasil, e pensar um abolicionismo programático. E o programa é óbvio. Dizer, como é que você diminui? Começa pelas drogas. E pelas drogas qual? pela maconha, né, e por, e por audiência de custódia, e por, então, por muito tempo o abolicionismo no Brasil ficou um pouco uma vanguarda, assim, que chotesca. E eu acho que a, a notícia aqui é essa, né, a gente tem que começar a assumir essas, essas perspectivas uma a uma para poder resolver. Mas isso não está num horizonte rápido de ação, né? isso é uma mobilização política e então. tal. Eu, eu só acho que para essa discussão em relação ao seminário tem que ser 
Não, não é fácil. Nesse, nesse sentido, certo? Eu fiz até vou mexer. Não, não, não. É isso, né? É mais uma coisa. É outra coisa. É, então, com essas considerações, é, eu, a Crimpedia está com uma plataforma aberta. Aberta, sim. É, então, talvez pode, ficasse isso. É. Pode, qualquer um pode escrever, contribuir, que, que nem na, na Wikipedia. Em qualquer língua, tem artigos em português e não sei o quê. E é aberto. Só que na, na prática só sou eu. Só eu. <risos> Mas a, às vezes eu obrigo a estudantes a fazer um artiguinho de como trabalho de seminário. E aí, eu sei que tem mais duas questões, mas poderíamos deixar as duas questões para o início da aula de amanhã? Porque senão vai ficar tarde, porque o professor tem compromisso, como vocês vão estar aqui amanhã, certo? Então, fica, mas, pode ser? Pode, pode. Eu acho que talvez seja mais prudente fazer o horário. Pois, Tudo bem, temos amanhã, então.